So our next speaker, as we zoom back into the ag industry in general, and all the way from Ireland, where it's currently 10.30 p.m. on Wednesday night, is Nolag Heffernan. Nolag is an independent management consultant specialising in leadership and organisational psychology. She is an author, specialist lecturer, an award-winning conference speaker, and I might add, a dairy farmer's daughter as well. Nolag works across all sectors, but is best known in the agricultural sector for delivering thought-provoking, relevant and enjoyable workshops, primarily to the dairy and pig industries on the subjects of leadership, employment, resilience and time management. Good evening, Nolag, and over to you to take us through my farming team, creating an irresistible workplace. I'm not sure whether to say good evening or good morning. It's all rather rather uh, complicated when we're doing time zones. But look, it's fantastic to be here. Thank you so much, Greg, for your kind introduction. And um, I would sincerely like to thank Greg for asking me to speak here today. And um, also to Lynn Gardner for all her excellent work behind the scenes. To uh, April Brown as well from Dairy Australia, and indeed to Dairy Australia for the continuing support of my work, in particular Bernie Baxter. Um, and it is a pleasure to be here and a privilege to be speaking with, um, you know, Elise Sharpley and of course Sharon Parrish, who will speak after me. So thank you very much for this opportunity. It is always a privilege um, to be involved in symposiums where there's a sharing of information. I would actually really like to thank Elise for her talk because it, it really is fantastic information that really and truly the dairy industry and every other sector, you know, needs to go back to a report such as the Irresistible Workplace and say, well, what do my employees want? So what I would like to do is, um, having worked, I work a lot across the Irish um, dairy industry, the UK dairy industry, I have worked um, for a couple of years now with Dairy Australia, I would like to take some of those ideas um, and maybe if I if I mis, mis, uh, interpret the information that these can, can uh, clear it up later on, but I want to make it as relevant as possible as what I find to, to what I find when I'm working in dairy businesses, um, but also referring as well I'm a, I'm a psychologist, so maybe looking at some of the thinking behind the ideas that are suggested as well. So looking at investment in dairy, and this actually happens to all businesses. So all businesses, they're going to start off and they want to develop themselves. And of course, we need money to develop as to be sustainable as business. So there's always a very heavy input into process, into system and into what, what I do. And at some point as the business grows and as uh, we want to do something different or we want to change our own roles, people go, oh, we forgot to think about people. And so when we listen to Greg's point earlier, where Greg said, actually, this is one of the most common questions I'm asked about, how do we manage the human asset? How do we deal with the, the people question in dairy? And um, this is why, because people and the dairy industry is really at a point in many, many countries where the, the cows are, are really, you know, we know so much now about cows in terms of, of um, nutrition, in terms of genetics and that. And uh, we, we all have um, so much information about the system that we're using that now the time has turned in terms of looking at people and people want, and, and so we see farmers looking beyond the farm gate and thinking about who can I bring into my system? And even more importantly, what, what does the rest of the world think about farming? So rather than with the head down and wondering what do, what do people, you know, not, not being concerned about what other, other people think, actually going, okay, we need to prevent more positively. Um, I really liked uh, Liz speaking about the um, positive employer brand. I would call that, you know, are, are your employees, are you as a, far, a dairy farmer, a brand ambassador for the industry? How does, it, how does the world view you? And that's prevalent at the moment because we see, you know, it, we've got environmental questions, we've got animal welfare questions. There are many questions that quite regularly put a spotlight onto agriculture and dairy and so we need to be able to answer those questions and to answer them well and of course who answers those questions well the dairy farm answers those questions but all, so do the employees so the critical thing when we look at um, people management in um, dairy is that you can't control this is any business you can't control what people say about you outside the gate so you need to make sure that their experience inside the gate is as as, as good as it can possibly be so you, you need to try and do your best to control what's said beyond the, the, um, the farm gate. And so we might use Deloitte's expression of the irresistible workplace. What is really fantastic about research that we would see from, from um, an organization like Deloitte or the rest of the world is that people management is a multi-billion dollar industry. The rest of the world has put a huge amount of, of work 
into this. So it's really important that dairy doesn't try to reinvent the wheel, but it looks outside itself and it looks for best practice. And so we see that from, from Deloitte's report on the Irresistible Workplace, taking those ideas and saying, okay, how is that relevant to dairy? How is that relevant to dairy in my locality? How is that relevant to me? And using that fantastic research that already exists and applying it in a way that fits within, within the dairy business or your own business. So we see that there is a dramatic shift. I, now, I must explain that this is situational because at any time in your farm, the, the, the slices of this pie to change, of course, you know, you're hit with animal health issues, then of course you're more focused on your cows or if you decide to change your system, you're more focused on that for a while. But we do see a big change into um, investing your time in people. And so that pie becomes skewed. Dairy is a triadic relationship. You require those three things to make a really good dairy business. Um, of course, I'm biased and I'm going to say, well, people are most important, um, but they are because actually you need people to have a good system and you need people to have good cows. But it is very typical to start with the good cows and the good, the good system first and then and then go, oh yeah, we forgot the people aspect. So um, actually in truth, I work across all sectors and the only time I've come across what I would consider the best practice I've ever heard of was um, is in dairy and where a dairy farmer known for his, his um, would be what I would tell the employer of choice said, I, I have the person and then I find the farm unit for them. So like this is a person, uh, this is a business is obviously working at scale, but they get the right person and then they look for the opportunity for that person. Now that's exceptional. I've never heard that happen in any other sector. We always kind of retrofit people to the system that we have. Businesses that stop retrofitting people and actually understand how that person fits into the jigsaw, they become irresistible places to work for all the reasons that I've described earlier. So just moving on, how do we think about this? Well, I developed this um, a, a couple of years ago and I do a lot of work with, with dairy farmers. We actually genuinely play this as a game in workshops. And the idea behind it is the employing game. Now, traditionally, you know, everybody knows the snakes and ladders game. Traditionally, it is a game of chance. This board is loaded. If you climb those ladders, you will avoid the snakes. And my point um, of, of, of for developing this idea was to show that being an employer of choice is an, is an ongoing journey, but it's also, you know, you can see it and it's quite sequential. There's a lot of things that you can do to make you a more um, irresistible employer today. Of course, when your head is down and you're busy in the farm, you think not more. I really have to do something else. Why can't I just have good employees? That's arrogance. It's vanity. And it doesn't happen like that. So for farmers and dairy, what we need to think, step back and say, it took dairy farmers a long time to get to the system where they are. It took them a lot of hard work to have great cows, to have a great system. It, it's, you know, it's foolish and naive to assume that, oh, it would be a snap of things and I get good people or I'd be a good employer. You have to work on that aspect as well, as much as you did on the other, on the other two. Um, and that's challenging when, you're, when your head is down and you're really under pressure. And of course, what happens then, you have a negative view of employees. And if you have a negative view of employees, the risk is you treat your employees badly and they go beyond the farm gate and tell that to people. So this game or this presentation of the idea of being an employer of choice, which is, as you will see, it's, it's the finish line. How do I get to that employer of choice? Um, and actually you start again, because every time you bring in a new employee, you're trying to climb back up this ladder. The idea is understanding what it is you can do and not being afraid to go on this journey. And when we start looking at that really po um, positively, we see that people start to enjoy being around people. And we see that farmers start to enjoy being around people. It is a learned skill set. It is not a dark art or a black magic. And so um, one of the things that's really important to, to point out to dairy farmers is that they weren't born, you know, or any farmer, they weren't born dairy farmers. They became dairy farmers. You're not born a leader. You're not born an employer of choice. You're not, you're not you know, divinely given a, an irresistible workplace. You work at it, you learn at it, you try and learn, you try different things. But many, many, many of the points that um, Elise discussed earlier are going to help you on that journey to make you a more positive employer and, of course, to create, help you create that employee of choice concept or that irresistible workplace. So taking that um, from my experience and what I would de deliver in different workshops and speaking to different farmers and working at different, um, you know, different ideas about dairy. Some of the things that you can do are really very simple. 
It's very difficult to do this if you're under pressure. So you need to do it at the time of the year when you want to change system or, or, or dive into something you're not comfortable with. It's important to do it in a, in a part of the year where there's time and space to do that. How do you do that? Well, one of the things that I speak a lot about is time management and looking for opportunities to be a good employer. Things would start off like we can see some of the things here, like a massive snake would be last minute hiring. You can see it here, number 19. So last minute hiring is, you know, you're, you're on the back foot already. It's not going to be a positive experience. Everybody feels negative about the whole thing. So it's really stepping back and thinking in how to become an irresistible um, workplace. You've got to be able to have a macro view of what your business looks like. You've got to be able to step back and say, exactly as you said, you know, what skill sets do I need? What, what can I offer? What can dairy offer as an industry? What do I individually as a business offer? And work our way through um, these, these challenges as much as possible, but understand that you will, as you did with your cows and as you did with your system, that farmers will, you're going to hit, you're going to hit walls, you're going to hit difficulties, but they are surmountable. In terms of creating that um, irresistible workplace, here are some really practical things and useful things that um, across a number of different sections that we found to be really useful. And again, they'll tie in quite well with the Deloitte report. So one of the things that we see in, in, in farm, farming is considered um, one of the, if not the most um, dangerous workplace because you have large machinery and you have animals. So health and safety is critical. There is a prevalence in, there has been, there has been a prevalence in farming. I would certainly hear, see it here in Ireland where I grew up here, I'm fine, I know it's in and out, I can take a chance, I can take a bit of a risk. And that, that's fine for you, but that is really, really risky behaviour to go down because not only is it dangerous, but it's also sending a signal to your employees that you don't care about them, that you don't care about yourself. And that's a huge statement. I think possibly the best example I had of that was delivering to a workshop here in Ireland and a unit manager who went through quite a high, you know, a well-recognized course for, for dairy managers. And um, she wanted to, she was applying for a job in her local area and this particular business was interested in an astering for an interview. And her parents were really delighted. They were like, this is a very well, very highly respected individual. It'd be great to work on the farm, great for your CV, et cetera, et cetera. And this individual drove in the gate, turned around and drove back because she looked around and she felt the workplace wasn't safe. So this is somebody who didn't even have a chance to entice an employee to work for them because of what they could see. So it's about telling a story that I respect you, I respect myself, I'm not putting myself at risk, I'm equally not putting my business at risk at doing, at, you know, taking risky behavior. So the list, simple things you can do in the beginning is just having so going through those um, very simple health and safety checks, looking around, having available, um, having the you know proper um, protective equipment available to your staff, they are simple things that create big gestures. So there's a huge panic about well that irresistible, like the irresistible workplace. It sounds big, it sounds expensive. Where do I start? I'm already heavily invested. How I, how do I go about this? Start small and think about yourselves. Uh, another great one I've heard is be a very typical Irish Irish thing to say, an Irish mammy, I suppose, saying, I think about where would I like to see my children working? That's my acid test. If I wouldn't like my, you know, if I, I think about what would I like, the circumstances I would like my children to work in, and that's what I try to replicate for my employees. Very, very simple. Very respectful. Um, and that's going to make sure that it's a, you know, health and safety is in place and that you're looking after it. Employment basics. Um, I'm just looking down because I'm just looking at some of the notes that I wrote that I was thinking of in terms of, of um, Elise speaking. But the employment basics is really about creating that clarity. So it's creating clear, clarity about role. We're, dairy is slack at doing that, unfortunately. And that's frustrating for people who want to know what they have to do on a, on, <coughs> excuse me, on a daily basis. Why is the industry typically slack at that? The majority of people who farm, dairy farmers who farm, grew up on farm. So they've been farming since they were two. It's absolutely second nature. So by the time they're 18 and the normal person, if we like, goes out into the workplace, they've had 16 years work experience. So there's so much that is really, they, they don't know how much they know. It's really phenomenal how highly capable dairy farmers are. And so there's, there's this, an intolerance that means, well, I don't have, why do I have to write that down? We do that every Monday. Everybody knows we do that every Monday. We've done that every Monday for the last 15 years. But if I'm a new employee into your business, how do I know that that's what you do on Monday? 
and you've just brought me into your business. It's completely new. And by next Monday, I've forgotten what I did last Monday because it's a new learning experience now, and I'm pretty much being bombarded by this new experience and, and all the information I'm trying to take in. So employment basics is about you know, putting structures and systems in place that make it easy for people to do the right thing. A little bit like Elise's point about the coaching, you know, doing the five good coaching for every one critical piece of coaching. You're making, you're not, you're not going for management by exception where you are, you know, they never see you till they do something wrong and all of a sudden you, you appear from nowhere ready to spot them doing the wrong thing. You're actually making work as straightforward as possible for the people around you. And that can be really, really difficult. It can also be uh, frustrating to do because you know, you know how to do it so well that you being ha ha articulating what you do really well is quite difficult because it actually physically takes up a different part of your brain. So when we get something that's very routine and natural to us, it takes up a different part of the brain and that makes it very difficult to articulate. But once you get our, once you start to articulate your employment basics, clearly it makes it much, much easier for people to do their job properly. When people do their job properly, you can praise them for doing their job properly. They see they've done it properly and we get this really virtuous circle of achievement, feeling good, you've recognized it. And then that allows people to, to um, speak positively about their experience. Facilities is a very quick win. It doesn't have to be about you know, a five-star hotel on your farm, but it has to show that you care. It's a, it's a lick of paint, it's keeping on top of it, it's allowing it to look nice. It's, it's having standards within facilities so that your staff know to treat it well and that that's that's as important as treating the cow as well that's really important to get that across because that shows that that just shows respect all around and when we start doing things like looking at you know making making holding people accountable for that maintenance you put pride in the workplace pride is a very valuable commodity in the workplace when you put pride in the workplace employees will start to self-regulate so you've got a, a group of employees who look after the place who are proud of the place when a new employee comes in, they'll regulate that person. You, you, you stop having to do that as the employer because the um, by bringing in, by having that standards, they will regulate that person for you. They're saying, no, we don't do that around here. Please don't do that. That's not how we do it around here. Here we tidy up after us. Or here we treat the buildings with respect. Or here we do X, Y, Z. And so it becomes self-regulating and really useful. The physical work practices, you know, that's about removing drudgery. Brilliant expression I heard in the UK with a group and, and a well-known farmer moving towards that a kind of coveted employer of choice title is making things fun and easy. Now, of course, that is not always easy in, in the workplace, but, not, you know, removing drudgery, not going for the most difficult, complicated option, but looking at the system, looking at the process and saying, is there an easier way to do this? Like, are we, you know, there is somebody and they've hurt their back. What's going on here? What's happened? Why, why is this happening? Why is this always the job that everybody dreads? It might be because it's done through drudgery rather than being a smart, efficient, intelligent job. And that's where we see a huge, huge movement. I would say UK and Ireland, I'm sure it's in, in um, Australia as well, a huge movement towards lean management and more efficient work practices. And when Deming, who would be a, a, a lean management guru, um, said that it's easier to change the process than the person. So you're setting up the system to make it to make the person behave correctly if you like then if we move on we can invest in terms of support so really looking for support and when we think of elisa's work and deloitte's work we look at leadership being supportive and um, understanding personal differences that first and foremost um i think first and foremost uh, talking about an employer of choice or an irresistible workplace it's it's an organization it's a system that really likes people that really is excited about people. The biggest difference I would say between a good employer and a poor employer is that the good employer sees the sees staff as um, uh, the good employer sees them as an asset, and the poor employer sees them as a cost. And this is emotional. Like this comes right down to emotion. When you think about a cost, the majority of people think, oh, cost. You know, they feel negative about it. They want to get rid of it. It's a nuisance. They want to erode it. They want to diminish it. When you think about an asset, it's the completely opposite. I want to invest in it. I love it. I cherish it. And actually, if you become an employer, and this is part of progression that we look at it in a moment, if you become an employer who sells their asset on at a higher price, i.e. if employees can go through your business better than they came into it, you become an extraordinarily desirable person to work for because people have that, as Elise mentioned, they have progressed. They feel they've developed themselves. And that is very, very attractive to all of us, 
not just uh, potential employees. So that personal aspect, understanding, you know, having an ethos of respect for the workplace, having empathy, understanding that it is difficult for employees, you know, not just always assuming the worst about people, but actually saying, well, what are they going through today? I'm not saying for a second to be a psychologist. I'm just saying, step back and ask yourself, how would you feel? You know, what, what, what would you appreciate right now in this situation? Communication, again, a learnable skill set. Um, it's around, we hear a lot of people asking about meetings. How many meetings should I have a week? This is, I'm asked this constantly in, in farming. Is how many meetings should we have a week? Meetings is a very uh, has become a very public, uh, very public sector concept. So you know, private sector had got rid of it quite a long time ago. There's a huge shift away from meetings in farm businesses, regardless of the financial turnover um, of how big your business is. In terms of team teams, it's very small units. So you know, communication should be it's it's so frequent because you're dealing with people every day, and it should be frequent. It, it, the more you formalize it, the more likely um, it becomes tricky. So having that you know, flexibility, which is also appreciated by others. People feel they can come and speak to you because you're there. You can also, like, I'm not saying be available 24 hours a day, that's not being practice either. But what I am saying is don't get hung up on structures in terms of communication, because communication is the fundamental currency of people. And when you try to box that very much, it becomes a lot more difficult. However, by having your standard operating procedures in place, having good training, putting good training in place in the first place, you can el eliminate a lot of misunderstandings that happen in the workplace and you can move towards people being satisfied that they know what they're doing. Having the resources available means that people can do the job that you've asked them to do. Um, I think one of the most common, one, it, it, without fail actually, uh, if I ask a farming group, say where's the most time lost during the farm day? Every, every group will say looking for things. So this idea of lean management, a place for everything and everything in this place, making it easy for people to do the job, not punishing somebody for not getting the job done when they didn't have the resources to do it. So that and, and that can be physical um, resources or it could be the training you gave them or the support to do it or the capacity to uh, to understand that they learned it a different way to you. And so it's, you know, don't, you can't be hard on them for not picking up the idea straight away, going back and giving, using it as a, as a teaching opportunity to help them do it properly so they can move on and do it properly the next time. Accountability is, I, I'm really, I'm asked that across all sectors, like constantly asked about accountability. And I don't like, I don't like conflict, I don't like challenging people. How do we create, how, how can I hold people accountable? Irresistible workplaces have clear lines of, of accountability. Um, and and that, you know, even this idea, I love this idea, devolved decision of authority, like that still is very defined, though it sounds like you're just letting somebody walk off It's a, a, and do whatever they want. It's not that at all. It's about people know what they're accountable for, what the consequences are if it doesn't happen, and they're held accountable to that. And that's really important. Leadership, we know from research that people respond well to leadership that is strict but fair. So accountability Best way to hold people accountable for accountability, hold people accountable for their performance is knowing what the job looks like, what's good, what's good performance, poor performance, unacceptable, having good, a very clear understanding of why that employee is there in the first place. If you think I need an employee for something, a bit of something or a bit of work, it makes it very difficult to hold them accountable. Being able to clearly um, articulate what it is from that employee makes it much easier to see when they do it wrong and then makes it much easier to hold them accountable. Accountability is not a telling off or making somebody feel negative. And accountability is giving critical feedback at the right time so a person can do their job properly. When it's done properly, it's not personal and really moves your business forward. It also creates a huge amount of respect for the industry. The last investment um, uh, opportunity that I'm just going to speak about today is this idea of development. So training, you know, relevant to the business, um, you know, at the employer's cost, allowing somebody away, you know, oh, and on your time off, you can go on that hoof training course. Well, that's not time off then, is it? It's work related. So providing training, giving the skill set and allowing the person to pursue that training at your expense in terms of time sends a very powerful, very powerful message. Um, learning I have there because I think of learning as, you know, individual differences. It is very, very common in annual labor um, industries, uh, sectors, agriculture and um, construction, for example, to find people who have, who actually have learning disability. And so this is about, this is the idea of inclusion. Farming and agriculture provides fantastic opportunity for people to get, to get um, 
personalized training to help them to move along and then to contribute. And I think one of the best stories I, I heard in relation to that is a guy in Ireland um, working in New Zealand said he always knew he was brighter than other people said he was. And when he was working in uh, but struggles in the schooling system, when he went to uh, New Zealand, and he was the farm owner spotted his talents, gave him the opportunity to run a unit on his own. And he said to this day, he would swim to New Zealand to help that person. This is from Ireland. He would swim to New Zealand to help that person because they recognized something in him that he believed in, but nobody else seemed to spot. This guy has turned on to be a highly capable, excellent farmer um, and works with his learning differences positively and is a really uh, excellent advocate for saying everybody has an opportunity, everybody has ability. We just sometimes need to take longer. We just sometimes take longer to find other people. Progression. Um, Dairy kind of panics a bit and says, with no progression, our units aren't big enough, our business is big enough, how do we provide opportunity? That's a very hierarchical notion, quite old fashioned notion of progression in the sense that you must climb through ranks, you must climb the ladder. Progression is about an acquisition of skills. It's, it's making a person more developed, it's giving them a better CV, more rounded, more opportunity. Um, and that is, there are so many skill sets in, in dairy, so many, you know, the, the famous expression, um, a jack of all trades, actually dairy farmers in my experience are the are a jack of all trades and master of many of those skills. So there's plenty of opportunity. We just need to have a little bit of imagination sometimes as to how we can bring that to the, to the workplace, how we can offer that progression to our employees. And potential, you know, investing belief in employee capability, it allows employees to flourish. It allows them to be, just like my story in the chap who said he swam to New Zealand, you know, this person allowed me to flourish and I, I returned an abundance to them. So, you know, understanding that. But equally, you know, terminating contracts without, without antipathy, you know, making sure that you really are, when somebody doesn't fit your system, that you are able to allow that person to be released from your system and walk away, head held high, walking out there, there, they might be singing your praises, but they're at least not, not giving you, um, you know, not, not bad mouthing you outside of the farm gate. So in terms of those three concepts, very simply, we can load, if, if when we look at that next ladders idea, it's broken up into three sections. So think of employment as before employing, what can I do today to control and make things better? The initial employment, so people coming to your, you know, giving yourself, giving your business the best opportunity to retain staff. If people have a really great first impression, a really great first week, that's a huge, huge, a good beginning is half the work. So making that difference. And then ongoing employment. So just to map those on, uh, we've got, hopefully people can hear me. I'm not sure. I hear some background One more, noise. One more minute, Nalag, if we could. Yeah, I am. I can do it there. So look, before employing, get your health and safety right. Do your employment basics. So controllable. And it create that. Look at the foundation. We need a really good foundation on a pyramid. We can build that pyramid really high. Initial, that's controllable. So if I just, sorry, the control, that's totally controllable. We create that first impression. And then just the discipline to not sigh with relief and say, thank God I've got an employee, but to really think this is, I have an asset in my business and I need to continuously look after and cherish that person. So we've got that, we can apply those initial employment to make sure we're communicating well, that we're looking after the person, we have the resources available. We're holding them accountable in terms of their um, their performance. And at the top, development, providing that training, thinking about their learning capacity, their learning uh, uh, pr preferences, also progression. What can you I offer? I may not be able to offer the second unit, but what can I offer? I have a unit to manage. What can I offer? And understanding that everybody has potential um, as long as we look positively at people and see them as the asset rather than the cost. So um, again, I, I like to add Lisa's comments, a whistle stop tour. That's a whistle stop tour. Too. There are many things you can do on your farm today that really could move you along that journey to the irresistible workplace or the employer of choice. Thank you very much, Greg. Oleg, insightful and thought provoking as I knew it absolutely would be. Uh, your brutal honesty and uh, I could, I could absolutely listen for hours. Snakes and ladders seems like a good analogy for sure. Uh, thanks so much for sharing with us. If you'd like to ask Nolag a question or you have an additional thought or comment, please drop it in the Q&A tab to be addressed in our panel discussion.